Hello and welcome to World Panorama, your one-stop show for the biggest international news stories that unfolded this week. I'm Ashwarya Kapoor. Let's start the program with this week's headlines. Negotiations over Britain's departure from the EU remain at an impasse. No solution so far on the vexed Irish Ireland border question. Theresa May faces backlash over hint to extend Brexit transition to 2021. Saudi Arabia admits journalist Jamal Khashoggi killed inside its consulate in Istanbul. Kingdom sacks two high-ranking officials, including deputy intelligence chief. U.S. says it is saddened to hear confirmation by its close ally. Yemen on brink of a famine. UN says the nation is facing the world's worst hunger crisis with almost 13 million people facing starvation. Aid agencies struggle to deliver relief. Houthi militias accused of blocking vital aid from entering vulnerable cities. Bhutan's voters hand overwhelming victory to a new party headed by a surgeon in the Himalayan Kingdom's third democratic election. Centre-left party DNT wins 30 of the 47 National Assembly seats in the final round of vote. And uh, campaigning pick space ahead of the 6th of November midterm elections in the United States. President Donald Trump on a campaign trail looks to prevent a democratic takeover of Congress which would derail his legislative agenda and open door to multiple investigations of his presidency. Our top story this week, EU leaders have agreed not enough progress has been achieved in Brexit talks and have shelved plans for a special summit next month to sign off on a UK divorce deal. Now, one of the possible reasons seen is an impasse still remaining over the Irish border issue. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Theresa May faced a backlash over hint to extend the Brexit transition to 2021. An extension could mean the UK staying within the single market and customs union for more than five years after the Brexit vote. Prime Minister Theresa May's deal for her country's imminent departure from the EU appears far out of reach as the negotiations hit another stalemate on Thursday in EU summit in Brussels. Leaders from the European Union and the United Kingdom who met in Belgium on Wednesday in search of a Brexit solution failed to reach a deal. May reportedly infuriated MPs from all sides of her party by indicating that she is ready to delay the UK's final departure until 2021 in the hope of breaking the deadlock over the Irish border. After two days of the EU leaders' summit in Brussels, May also said that she was committed to reaching a deal that is mutually beneficial to Britain and the EU. On the withdrawal agreement, there are a few but considerable outstanding issues in relation to the Northern Irish backstop. I'm committed to working with the Commission and EU leaders to resolve these as quickly as possible. There's a lot of hard work ahead. There will be more difficult moments as we enter the final stages of the talks. But I'm convinced that we will secure a good deal that is in the interests of the UK and of the European Union. The two-day European Council summit was expected to be a moment of truth for both sides reaching agreement. But no deal was reached and the leaders of the 27 remaining EU states decided not to call a special Brexit summit in November after Chief Negotiator Michael Barnier said that he needed much more time for talks. The EU said it is ready to extend the proposed length of the post-Brexit transition period if the UK wants that. European Council President Donald Tusk said that he was sure EU leaders would respond positively to any request from Britain for a longer transition period after Brexit. 
EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker also echoed the words of Tusk, adding that a longer transition would allow British Prime Minister May and her 27 EU counterparts to prepare their future relationship. If the UK decided that an extension of the transition period would be helpful to reach a deal, I am sure that the leaders would be ready, ready to consider it, it positively. This is giving us some room to, the, to prepare the um, uh, future relation in, in the best way uh, possible. And I'm, I'm convinced that under the leadership of Donald, we'll find a deal with Britain. My working assumption is not that we will have a no deal. A no deal would be dangerous and for Britain and for the European Union. Earlier, Irish Prime Minister Leo Varadkar said that he was hopeful that Brexit deal will deliver legally binding guarantees. There will be no hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. We want there to be uh, the protection of citizens' rights uh, all across Europe. We want there to be a financial settlement. And we also need uh, a legally binding guarantee that there will not be uh, a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. The UK is due to leave the EU on 29th of March 2019 and the transition period is designed to smooth the path to a future permanent relationship. The UK has signed up to the principle of agreeing an Irish border backstop an insurance policy designed to prevent the need for customs checks in case there is a gap between the transition period and the future permanent relationship coming into force. The problem is that the two sides have yet to agree what form the backstop will take and how long it could last. The UK voted to leave the EU in a June 2016 referendum. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. All right, let's uh, put things in perspective. We have with us uh, Mr. Shiv Shankar Mukherjee, former ambassador, joining us. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, for joining us. Uh, so now Brexit is less than six months away and the British government is still no closer to reaching an agreement uh, with the EU. Uh, despite another round of negotiations that we saw this right. week. What do you think about the Brexit negotiations and what would be the possible consequences in case there is a no deal? Well, uh, you know, in, to put it very simply, the negotiations are, uh, as far as the UK is concerned, in a total mess. You know, I think it was, uh, Einstein is reported to have said that uh, insanity consists of trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. David Cameron wanted a referendum because he thought uh, nobody would vote for, almost nobody would vote for leaving the European Union and that a victory in a referendum would uh, silence the dissenters he had in his own party. What happened was Brexit, yes. the law of unintended consequences. Uh, later, the new Prime Minister, Theresa May, because she was uh, you know, fed up with her own party, her own minister snapping at her heels, went in for a general election to, to boost her majority, which she already had in Parliament, and ended up with a, uh, in, a in a shambles where uh, she, she, uh, they got less than the majority of seats needed and had to go in for a very clumsy coalition with the uh, Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland. Yes. So the political uh, setup in the UK has gone from bad to worse. Yes. Brexit, everybody knows initially, uh, was a victory of populism and propaganda uh, and, and that kind of uh, populist uh, rhetoric over logic. But, you know, the UK government had to live with it. Yes. Uh, so that, in that background, the fact that uh, Theresa May's hands are more or less tied within her own party, forget about the objections raised by the U EU, is making these very complex negotiations almost, almost uh, impossible uh, to, to come to a conclusion which is satisfactory to both sides. Yes. Right now the situation is this. There have been agreement on a lot of issues, painstaking negotiations and so on. The EU has made it very clear that their red lines are the following. One, no cherry picking. Uh, you can't just select the things that are good for you and reject the things that are bad for you. Uh, number two, and that's a very important red line for the European Union, is that they can hardly agree to a deal where those who prefer to remain in the European Union are worse off than the ones who want to leave the European Union, like the UK. I and mean, there's no question of that. Right. 
On the UK side, the biggest problem is that within her own party and the coalition, there's no unanimity, there's no consensus. True. She tried to, Theresa May tried to ram through a consensus in this uh, well-known checkers meeting. Yes. Uh, and uh, number one, that was immediately and vocally rejected by a number of her ministers, as well as yes. you know people like Boris Johnson, who are, a, who are extremely, uh, extreme hardliners as far as Brexit is concerned. Right. Uh, and in the subsequent meeting that Theresa May had in, 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 with the European leaders, it was brutally rejected by the European Union. Yes. Right now, the, apart from other issues, the most important issue is the question of the hard border between Northern Ireland and, and the Republic of Ireland. At the moment, the border is invisible. So why is this issue so This issue is crucial? very important for two reasons, for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, Northern Ireland, of course, uh, has had three decades of violence, you know, what they call the Troubles. Uh, and that was uh, an uneasy peace. And now, uh, you know, the peace is held after the Good Friday Agreement some years ago. Uh, that is, of course, crucial for uh, peace in, in uh, Northern Ireland, which is a part of the UK. Uh, Northern Ireland... Uh, its largest trading partner across that invisible border, mm -hmm. where there are no customs checks of any kind, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 30% of its trade is with the Republic of Ireland, which is more than the trade, let's say, trade dependency between any two countries, adjacent countries, anywhere in the world. Uh, so, politically, uh, the open border, the invisible border, is essential for maintaining the peace that has come out of the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. If it becomes a hard border... Mm -hmm then uh, the anticipation is that all kinds of, uh, you know, political problems, including the return of the sectarian violence, uh, may return. All right. uh, secondly, although the, both the EU and the UK have said they don't want a hard border, yes. uh, there are differing views on how to sort it out. Mm -hmm. There's a backstop, which is yes. a sort of a temporary uh, kind of arrangement where the border will remain sort of invisible with uh, technology providing the invisibility, but there will be customs checks. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and nobody really knows exactly what that entails. Uh, and the other thing is, the European Union has said that Northern Ireland could, uh, because after all, Republic of Ireland is calling the shots here and it's a member of the European Union. Yes. Uh, your, the Northern Ireland could stay as a member of the customs union of the EEC. Yes. And that is a red line for the UK is concerned because that means you're drawing a border through the middle of the Irish Sea. And notionally, it really means the end of the United Kingdom. Don't forget that out of, the, out of Northern Ireland, Wales, England and Scotland, hmm. uh, everybody voted to remain except for England. England Wales voted to remain. True. Scotland wanted to remain, Northern Ireland also. Mm -hmm. So this is the situation now where uh, the, re the, the hard border uh, is at the moment the most visible uh, problem in terms of getting a, a, a deal acceptable to both sides. But there are other issues which still have to be sorted out. Now the Brexiteers within Theresa May's cabinet are up in arms because of her latest proposal of an extended transition. Yeah. Which doesn't matter to the EU because if the, it, it means the UK remains within the customs union uh, and uh, all, the, all the rules of the, e, uh, the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Brexiteers are up in arms because that means they have to keep paying their dues to the European Union and there are figures of £15 billion being tossed about. Mm -hmm. So you have very complex and divisive UK politics. Yes. You have a European Union which really has all the cards in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, what do you have? Good deal, no deal, or bad deal? The UK has said no deal is preferable to a bad deal. Mm. A good deal, a really good deal, which is good for both sides, seems almost impossible. So are we talking of a no deal? The Prime Minister of the UK, as she must, says, no, we, we are going to get a good deal, we've done a lot of work, blah, blah, blah. The European Union hopes for a good deal, but, there, but the people who really matter on the ground, the businessmen in the UK, yes. are already preparing uh, their plans for a no deal.
So there you have it. So in that case, if that really happens, in case there is no deal, there's, there are also talks of a second referendum. Uh, there have yes. been talks that uh, were, was the 2016 uh, Brexit referendum a mistake? And in case uh, there is a second referendum, would that be democratic? Would that, would that can Well, that it would be democratic happen? if the people of UK want it. And yes. there are, there's a, the voices wanting a second referendum are getting stronger and stronger. Yes. It is now becoming very clear that the Brexit vote in, was not in the UK's national interest. It was an aggrieved population uh, who were, you know, uh, scared out of their wits by the, 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 the rhetoric unleashed at them about immigrants taking over their jobs mm -hmm. with the subtext of terrorism and so on and so forth. Uh, it's now becoming very uh, clear to them that it was a mistake and that therefore there's an expectation that a second referendum would right that wrong. But however, it is very difficult for a conservative government, for any government in the UK or, or any democratic country for that matter, to say that there was a referendum, it turns out to be a mistake, that would take the kind of moral courage yes. that almost no government on this planet has. Absolutely. So, so while a second referendum in, 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 is being asked for in many quarters, um, it's, it seems unlikely. So indeed, uh, the coming weeks actually, I think, will decide if Britain and EU can really forge a, a relationship that can work for their peoples or not. But so far, the negotiations on Britain's departure from the EU are, of course, behind schedule. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for joining us and sharing your perspective on that entire story. Thank you so much. Thank you. And on to the other top story this week, uh, Bhutan voters have chosen a centre-left DNT in general election. The party won 30 of the 47 National Assembly seats, the lower house of parliament, and according, this is according to the provisional results. The voters handed an overwhelming victory to DNT, a new party headed by a surgeon in the third democratic election held by the Himalayan Kingdom. DPT secured uh, the other 17 seats in uh, the runoff contest that was limited to two parties. The first round of voting was held in September, in which DNT and DPT got maximum votes, while the ruling PDP came third and failed to qualify for the last round. DNT leader uh, Lotte Shering, a 50-year-old surgeon, vowed to work for nation building. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi had uh, also called on Bhutan's newly elected Prime Minister to congratulate him on his election win. And in World Panorama, we'll take a very short break here, but don't go anywhere. More global stories that made headlines this week coming up ahead. Stay tuned. Welcome back after the break. On to the other big story this week. Saudi Arabia has confirmed the death of missing Saudi journalist and Washington Post columnist Jalamal Khashoggi, claiming that he died in a fist fight at the country's consulate in Istanbul. Now, a statement from Saudi Arabia's public prosecutor said that a fight broke out between Khashoggi and people who met him in the consulate, ending with his death. Saudi's state television said that two high-ranking officials have been removed from their posts, including the deputy head of a Saudi intelligence service. The Saudis have also set up a commission led by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman that will restructure the Saudi General Intelligence Directorate and will have one month to release a report. The journalist was last seen entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul on 2nd of October to pick up some paperwork on his marriage. Meanwhile, US President Donald Trump said that what happened was unacceptable, but Saudi Arabia was a great ally. He said that the arrests were an important first step and praised the kingdom for acting quickly. While Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi's disappearance has uh, caught the entire world's attention, crisis unfolds in neighboring Yemen. The U.S.-backed Saudi-led war is threatening to engulf millions of Yemeni people in the worst famine the world has seen in over 100 years. The World Food Programme, which is the UN agency coordinating relief efforts in the shattered country, revised its estimate that it gave just two weeks ago of 8.5 million Yemenis on the brink of famine, stating that another 5.6 million are being driven to starvation by the effects of the three-and-a-half-year-old war on the country's infrastructure and economy.
situation in Yemen turning bad to worse. The poorest Arab nation faces the world's worst hunger crisis. Three quarters of its population on the brink of starvation. The country has been torn apart by more than three years of civil war between the internationally recognized government backed by a Saudi-led military coalition and the Iran-aligned Houthi movement. Years of near-constant fighting in the Gulf state have brought the already impoverished country to its knees. Thousands of Yemenis rallied this week in Taiz, the country's second biggest city, to protest the deteriorating economic conditions in the war-torn country, asking the coalition to open the country's airports and give back its allegedly stolen resources. We are starving and our children are dying. The cities are under siege and there's unemployment. We want to tell the regime and the Arab coalition that when hunger is the engine for these people, discussions, negotiation and treaties collapse. And the only solution is immediately supplying a loaf of bread. Soaring prices have put some basic commodities out of reach for many Yemenis. And the central bank has struggled to pay public sector salaries. The currency Rial has lost more than half of its value against the US dollar since the start of the war in 2015. Heads rolled this week with Yemen's President Mansoor Hadi sacking Prime Minister Ahmed bin Dagir, blaming him for the economic crisis. Mine Abdul Malik Saeed has been appointed as the new Premier. Everything changed in Yemen. The rise in prices is cruel. We are fighting to survive. The United Nations Food Agency says number of Yemenis on the brink of famine in coming months could rise to 13 million or 2 in 5 of the population from an earlier estimate of 8.5 million due to escalating war and a deepening economic crisis. Worse, fighting around the main port city of Hodida means that World Food Programme workers have not been able to supply 51,000 tons of wheat stocks at the Red Sea Mills facilities. The Saudi-led alliance has imposed a blockade on Hodida since the end of last year, saying it was to prevent Houthis from importing weapons. UNICEF says 1.8 million children suffer from acute malnutrition in Yemen, 4 lakh of whom are battling severe cases. It has called on the coalition to halt airstrikes so that humanitarian aid might be provided. Yemen is currently facing the world's worst hunger crisis, with 18 million people through the country not knowing where the next meal is coming from. Since June, 570 people have had to flee their home from fighting in Odeda. While local currency undergone an alarming depreciation and the cost of basic food items has gone up by a third since this time last year, the roots of the Yemeni conflict extend from a failed transition of power between former authoritarian president Ali Abdullah Saleh and current president in exile Mansoor Hadi in November 2011. Since then, Yemen has been ripped asunder by the conflict between its Saudi-backed provisional government that backs Hadi and rebel Houthis backing former president Saleh. While the death toll stands at roughly 10,000, particularly since the Saudi bombing campaign began in 2015, many millions have been displaced from their homes and with no aid coming into the country, its infrastructure is crumbling. And now the humanitarian crisis for ordinary citizens is reaching a breaking point. The UN warns that the country is facing a full famine within the next two to three months if circumstances do not change. Bureau report, Rajas Abhati. On 6th of November, American voters get to decide the direction of the country once more in the midterm elections. There are local races and 36 states that will choose their governors, but key races are for the members of both chambers of Congress that help push through laws in the United States. All 435 members of the U.S. House of Representatives serve two-year terms and are up for vote. And terms in the Senate are six years long and so about a third of the Senate seats are up for grabs. Right now, the Republican Party has got the control of both chambers of Congress and the White House. And all the signs point to Republicans losing the House but retaining the Senate.
celebrities in America are calling out to voters for the midterm elections scheduled on 6th of November. To elect members to each of the 435 House seats and 35 of the 100 Senate seats. While several of these celebrities are simply calling on people to register and get to the polls, several others are calling on people to help flip the swing districts. The march on DC, that was something special, but you can't keep marching. We can't march every time something happens because there's a huge amount of marching and then it's over and women were glad that they did it, but okay, now what? And the thing I think, the only thing I think that we can do and the thing we must do is vote. That every woman in the United States of voting age has got to vote. Otherwise, stop complaining. Do not complain if you don't vote. President Donald Trump's name may not be on the ballot in these polls, but the midterms will certainly be a referendum on his unconventional first two years in office. Trump is being seen holding several rallies in key states as part of a hectic tour designed to help Republicans defend their majority in the House and keep control of the Senate. Opinion polls show Democratic voters are more enthusiastic about voting in the congressional elections, but Republicans have narrowed the gap in recent weeks. Trump, among other issues, used the bitter Senate confirmation battle for Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh to try to boost Republican voter enthusiasm. On November 6th, you will have the chance to stop the radical Democrats, and that's what they've become by electing a Republican House and a Republican Senate, we will increase our majorities. We need more Republicans. We need more Republicans. Interestingly, the party that holds the White House typically loses seat in the midterm congressional elections. Right now, the Republican Party controls both chambers of Congress, and many analysts predict that Democrats will be able to take control of the lower chamber of Congress, the House of Representatives, but it is far from clear if they can also capture the Senate. In House of Representatives, all 435 seats are up for re-election. Democrats need 24 seats to flip the House. Here, history suggests the grand old party, the GOP or the Republican Party, will struggle to maintain its majority. Turnout is expected to be the key. As far as the Senate is concerned, 35 of 100 seats are up for re-election. Democrats are defending 26 of the 35 seats. Democrats need two seats to take the Senate. Here, Republicans should have an easier time defending Senate majority as several of the seats that they are defending, such as in West Virginia, are in states where Trump won a large victory in the 2016 presidential race. Trump himself has pitched the midterm vote as a verdict on his leadership. For Trump, the stakes are dramatic. A Democratic takeover of Congress could expose Trump to impeachment investigations and lead to multiple probes into his administration, just as he prepares for his own re-election fight in 2020. The 6th of November elections will test the strength of Donald Trump's hold on the party. It will also show just how lasting an imprint his unique mix of populism and nationalism will make on the Republican Party and America for years to come. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, that's all in this edition of World Panorama. But before we go, take a look at this French startup that is using drones and 3D technology to create digital reconstructions of cultural heritage sites destroyed by conflict in the Middle East. Technicians at this startup named Econem use drones and digital cameras to take hundreds of thousands of photographs of at-risk or destroyed cultural heritage sites. And then, with the use of specially created algorithms, artificial intelligence and supercomputers, the 3D reconstructions of the sites are made. The startup hopes uh, that uh, their digital reconstructions will be used when the time comes uh, to rebuild war-torn cities such as Aleppo in Syria and Mosul in Iraq. So take a look at these as we take your leave. I'll see you next week with another edition of World Panorama. Bye-bye.